Good morning, everyone. I'd like you to bow your heads for a moment of prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you that we can be here today to worship in your house. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing that we have from you. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Saviour. And Lord, I pray this morning that uh, as the word is opened, that uh, the words that are spoken may be your words. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank Gary for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, because uh, last time I spoke, I spoke on the subject of our sure salvation. And one of the key texts which uh, I used in that, uh, at that time was John 5.24. And you might like to look that up with me as I share that with you. And uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And verse 24 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. And so that is one of the great promises of the Bible regarding salvation. Um, there is, however, a little more to the story than that. And... Um, I want to continue that theme on today and uh, I have entitled the talk that I will give you today Ready for Jesus to Come. And uh, I think that uh, that is a very important topic that we need, to, we need to consider as we have been studying in, uh, in the uh, Sabbath school lessons. We know how uh, Israel came to the borders of the promised land and then because of their lack of faith they didn't enter in to the promised land at that stage. They had to wander in the wilderness for a long time. Now I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, today I want to, to uh, I have divided the service into <coughs> two segments. <coughs> the first part where we are looking at uh, the signs of Jesus coming. And uh, we read about those in Matthew chapter 24 uh, from the words of Jesus himself, the word of Jesus himself. And we're looking at today, the whole chapter actually is... is um, really uh, devoted to telling us about uh, the signs of his coming, but also about the destruction of Jerusalem, which are, they're intertwined together. And um, verses 6 and 7, we read this. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Now, do we see these things about us in the world today? Do we, do we see um, the, the things that are mentioned there, wars? How many wars are going on in the world today? I don't actually know but I know that there's wars all over the place. We know that um, uh, the United States of America has been in Afghanistan for nine years fighting a war there. Uh, twice as long, more than twice as long as they were involved in World War II. Uh, there are wars everywhere. Do we hear of rumours of wars? We certainly do, don't we? Um, and the one that comes to my mind when I think about rumours of wars 
is the situation that exists in the Middle East where we have huge um, unrest. Uh, there's the State of Israel, there's the Palestinians, um, there are various other of the Arab states, and um, Iran in particular is, uh, appears to be anyway to be engaged in a program endeavouring to, to uh, obtain nuclear weapons. And um, that of course causes great disquiet for the State of Israel, to the United States of America, because they don't want extra uh, nuclear powers. Do we see earthquakes? Do we see increasing numbers of earthquakes? Actually, we do, you know. I looked up uh, some statistics, and um, the number of earthquakes in the world over the last 20 years has something like quadrupled. Uh, and uh, some official statistics that, that I found indicate that this year, there will be more than 150,000 earthquakes that will be felt by people somewhere in the world. That will be felt by people. But there are estimated to be another 900,000 that won't be felt by people. And so the, the number of earthquakes are increasing. We see tsunamis, don't we? We've all got very vivid memories of the the recent uh, tsunami in the Pacific. And uh, the devastation that was caused there. Um, what about um, plagues and this sort of thing? We see plagues in the world today, don't we? There's the um, uh, various plagues that are actually going around. And um, what about terrorism? Terrorism is rife in the world today. The United States appears to be almost uh, paralysed by fear of terrorism, and I guess rightly so. Can anyone doubt that Jesus is coming soon? I don't believe so. I don't believe that we should doubt. <coughs> Now, <coughs> I don't propose to conduct um, a study on, in prophecy today, but I would like you to turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Sorry, Revelation, yes, Revelation 13 and verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And who do we associate that beast with? Yes, I, I, that's correct. We, we associate that beast with the papal system, with the papacy. <coughs> and uh, this, this um, beast power uh, during the Dark Ages martyred millions of people. People who refused to worship this beast power, they refused to give up their faith in God and to follow the traditions of Rome. Now come down with me to Revelation 13 and verses 11 to 17. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, coming out of the earth this time. Remember, the other one came out of the sea. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who worship in it, who dwell in it, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth 
by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not, as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. We recognise here, as we read this portion of scripture, that uh, the United States of America is portrayed here as the, the lamb-like power which begins to speak like a dragon. And um, th this uh, prophecy that we're reading um, here is partly fulfilled, isn't it? The United States of America today does exercise great power. It's not fully fulfilled yet. Um, the, it has taken on the role of the world's policeman. And since 9-11, as it's called, that infamous day when so many thousand people lost their lives, it, the United States has begun to act as a police state in many ways. And um, I think that this is, is very well known, but the, the instances when they have um, had people plucked um, from around the world and taken to some of their um, internment camps, I suppose you would call them, where they were uh, kept for years uh, without charge, without uh, being given the right to appear before a court, some of them eventually freed as being innocent. And um, we can see the words of this prophecy being partly fulfilled. Look with me at um, uh, verse 13. Still, still in, um, sorry, yeah, 12 and 14. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. <coughs> I don't think that this part of the prophecy has been fulfilled yet, has it? We're still looking at future events, but the question is how far future at this point in time. I don't have very much room on this, um, this little uh, podium. Are there signs that this could happen soon, that we could see the United States um, enforcing an image to the beast? I believe that, that this is so. <coughs> I'd like to uh, share with you a document <coughs> which some of you will have seen because um, Loretta has circulated it to some people within the church. Um, this is um, an email that was sent to me by my sister from Auckland who received it from the Hope Channel, the people at the Hope Channel. And um, who's seen, who has seen this here? I know that some have. Yeah, there's a couple. But um, I want to share some of the points that are here with you today because I want, to, I want us all to realise just how close to the end of time we actually are as we see these things being fulfilled. And uh, this begins, I, my sister says, she received uh, this email recently uh, from Hope Channel. Recently Obama went to Italy to meet President Barack Obama went to Italy to meet for the G8 summit. He also had a personal interview with the Pope and the Pope presented him with a copy of the Pope's 
latest encyclical. And the Pope prepared this just for this summit and for President Obama. The folks at Hope read it, and it is called Charity of Truth. And Hope believes this is a wake-up call for Seventh-day Adventists. They've listed 10 points which the Pope has made which seem to directly fulfill the SDA understanding of Bible prophecy, and I'll share these points with you now. Number one, our global government. The Pope is calling for a true world political authority to fix the problems that plague the world today. And number two, the Pope says this new political authority will make its decisions based on spiritual values. Number three, these spiritual values cannot be derived from just any religion since not all religions are equal, says the Pope. Number four, religion, politics and the economy. The church must influence all areas of society since God must have a place in the public realm, specifically in regard to its cultural, social, economically, economic and particularly its political dimensions. Point four. <coughs> Sorry, point five. Power to enforce law. This political authority must have real teeth and be vested with the effective power to enforce its laws around the world. Point six, control buying and selling. The new world governing power will institute socialistic policies for government to redistribute wealth. Point seven, Labor unions are to be empowered to play a decisive role in the new world order. Point seven, the church's goal. Pope Benedict says that this encyclical is to help achieve the goal of the history of the human family, to build the universal city of God. Point nine, Redefining religious liberty. I think these headings have actually been put in by the Hope people, but Pope, Pope Benedict says that uh, this encyclical is to help achieve the goal of the history of the human family to build the universal city of God. Sorry, I, I think I read that one twice. Uh, re redefining religious liberty. While claiming not to interfere in any way in the politics of states, the Pope redefines liberty as happening when the world obeys laws shaped by the Roman Church's spiritual values. According to the Pope, as the Church influenced states to enforce its view of truth on others, people are set free. This mission of truth is something that the church, the papal church, can never renounce. Immortal souls is point 10. The non-biblical belief uh, that man has an immortal soul helps to ensure the Pope's global agenda because he said... Man is God's creature whom God chose to endow with an immortal soul. I think you can actually see those points, each point building upon point as the, um, the Pope endeavours to, um, to build his uh, influence and his empire. The Pope's views... <clears throat> on the redistri redistribution of wealth and his agenda set forth in Charity and Truth, which incidentally is quite a large document, echo many of the same themes that Obama campaigned for last year. As a result, the White House was excited about the meeting, as this insider describes. 
the, the encyclical ramped up the level of White House enthusiasm for this meeting because you can't read it without sensing that these two men are seeing economic questions the same way, says a Catholic, ins a Catholic advisor to the White House. The Holy Father's emphasis on putting the human person at the centre of the economy strongly echoes themes that Obama campaigned on and is working to implement. So there we have it. The end may be nearer than we thought. <clears throat> the point is, we must be ready because Jesus said he would come like a thief in the night. He would come at such an hour as we expect him, not as we don't expect him. Come with me to Matthew chapter 25, and this is the second part of this um, talk today. Matthew 25. We need to remember as we look at this that um, Jesus began in Matthew 24 to tell the disciples about the signs of his coming. But Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 are all part of the one statement that Jesus gave, which was recorded for us who live in the last days of Earth's history. And um, there's a whole heap of stuff in here that, that we could spend our time on, but I want to, to look um, briefly at the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, the five wise and the foli five foolish. And I'd like to read that and then perhaps discuss that a little. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You know, this is um, a very, very sobering um, thought, a very sobering parable that Jesus gave here for us today, I believe. When we think about it and, and um, consider the implications of what he said, he spoke about ten virgins. And in, in the Bible, virgins uh, depict purity. And I believe that when Jesus gave this parable, he had in mind the Seventh-day Adventist church because we actually have the pure doctrine that, that was given to us by God following on from 1844. Um, I know that there will be many other people in heaven who do not belong to this denomination, but um, I believe we have been given a particular responsibility in the world today to present the th three angels' messages to the world. And we, we have a, um, a series of doctrines, you might call them the foundations or the pillars of our faith. Um, so that's really just to... Um, 
emphasize my feeling that, that this certainly relates to us, it may relate to other people as well, but I believe it has a particular emphasis for us here today. And we need to actually consider the, the various other components of this parable. There were the virgins. There was, it says right at the beginning that five were wise and five were foolish. And there were the lamps, weren't there? And the lamps had in them oil. And there was also a wick which actually brought up the oil to be burned. The interesting part about it is that it says in this parable that all slumbered and slept. In other words, perhaps they weren't ready. Um, certainly they, they were, I guess you could assume from that that um, they waited so long that they actually fell asleep while they were waiting. And uh, we, can, we can actually translate that into our own experiences, whatever they may be. Um, and I think that, you know, we become, we tend to become, in this day and age, we become a little blasé, I think, um, about the coming of the Lord. Because we've preached it for so long and he hasn't come yet, but he said he will come at such an hour as we think not, when we're, when we're least expecting him. It also say, it talks about as it will be as it was in the time of Noah. How people were marrying and giving in, marri giving in marriage and so on. These things, life was going on just as normal. And, um, and so it will be right until the end of time. So we have the lamps, and the lamp without oil in it is not much use, is it? If you have a lamp and it's got no oil to burn, it's not going to give you any light. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> and so the lamp on its own is useless. It must have oil. The oil, as we all know, I'm sure, represents the Holy Spirit. We must have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, I think that, you know, this is um, a point that, that I want to emphasize today. We, how can we obtain the Holy Spirit in our lives? I think that um, Jesus promised the disciples before he went that he would send the comforter to them and to replace his personal presence there and we can have the the uh, the comforter or the holy spirit in our lives as we uh, commune with jesus in prayer as we read the word and study it and um, as we get to know him on a personal basis then we will experience the presence of the holy spirit in our lives I'd like to just read again verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. <coughs> There's various pieces of paper here. Okay, um, from the Desire of Ages and on pages, page 324, we read these words. It is not necessary for us deliberately to choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. If we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love self-indulgence and temptation to sin. 
We may leave off many bad habits. For the time we may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. I can't emphasize enough the significance of these thoughts and the importance of us um, maintaining that relationship uh, with Jesus um, day by day. <coughs> There's so many, I have a, um, I've culled a, um, a series of statements here um, from the Spirit of Prophecy and I don't have time to share more than one or two with you. But uh, from the Ministry of Healing, communion with God will enable the character and the life. Men will take knowledge of us as the first disciples that we have been with Jesus. This will impart to the worker a power that nothing else can give. Of this power, he must not allow himself to be deprived we must live a twofold life, a life of thought and action, of silent prayer and earnest work. And then finally, no man is safe for a day or an hour without prayer. It's, it's a really um, sobering thought, isn't it, that we can, we can simply drift away from the Lord if we allow ourselves to. And I know so well the, the pressures of the world today as we endeavour to, to uh, seek work, make a living, um, perhaps provide for our old age as, as um, you know, everyone endeavours to do in this day and age. But we must not neglect the um, relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. I have so much more here that <coughs> I could share, but I think that I have made the point and um, I hope it's my prayer that each and every one of us here this morning will be found ready and waiting when Jesus comes. And um, our final hymn this morning is um, What a Day That Will Be When My Saviour, When My Jesus I Shall See. Thank you, uh, musicians.
Our Father, Lord, we just thank you that you have revealed to us the things that will happen before you come. Lord, may each one of us here be ready and waiting when you come and not sleeping. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.